Many of us know Honda as the company that makes extremely reliable cars that are front-wheel drive. That's from regular commuter cars to full-blown sports cars. But even if they were known for front-wheel drive cars, one car stood out from the rest of their lineup, the Honda S2000. Long story short, it stood out because it was rear-wheel drive, was a convertible, and it has a screaming VTEC engine. Yes, I know the Honda NSX was also rear-wheel drive, but there was something about the S2000 that just made enthusiasts flock towards it. It got so popular it became an icon, and the S2000 is one of those cars that holds its value over time. So how did it become an icon? How did it become a crowd favorite? Join me in this journey as we find out how the Honda S2000 became a JDM icon. The Honda S2000 was actually released in 1999, but to fully understand why it is what it is today, we need to go back to 1962. Back then, Honda was supposed to make a car that was practical, had four seats, and was family friendly. But instead, Honda being Honda, they would come back with two convertibles and a mini truck. Yes, Honda did have a mini truck. These cars would be known as the S360, S500 and a T350. We know Honda today as the automaker that perfected front-wheel drive, but back then, they actually began with rear-wheel drive convertibles. The model S500 was basically a rear-wheel drive, four-wheel motorcycle in the shape of a car. The engine was tiny and had individual carbureted cylinders that had a red line of 9,500 RPM making it scream down the road as you rev it out. It used a chain drive contraption to give power to the rear wheels. The S500 was basically everything Honda wanted with cars. It was simple, mechanical, fun, and it wasn't boring. By 1970, the S500 would have a bigger engine, and it would also be called the S800. Mr. Honda was getting older so he stepped back from the operations of the company. Other business leaders started to gain more influence in the company so they started shifting towards fuel efficient cars. This is all they focused on in the next 30 years and it seemed like Honda had changed. It looked like Honda had forgotten its roots. The S-Line Roadsters were killed off and they shifted to the front wheel drive setup. They would make cars like the Civic and the Accord, although they did produce sportier versions like for example the Civic Type R and the Integra Type R, which were really good cars by the way, but those cars were still far from what the company started with, until 1995. The year was 1995 and in the Tokyo Motor Show, Honda surprised the entire automotive industry. They would show off their SSM concept or Honda Sports Study model concept. The design language was stylish, it had a sleek body design and was a convertible. Was Honda showing that it hadn't forgotten its roots all along? Well, a Honda engineer Daisuke Sawai led this study and this was the message everyone got from the SSMTs. Honda never forgot its roots and the spirit of their founder. The SSM concept had a drop top body and it featured a 2 litre 5 cylinder VTEC engine. Fans would be teased by this car for the next 4 years until 1999, Honda finally unveiled their next S car. Nearly 30 years after the last S car, the S2000 was released to the world. Japan got first dibs on the S2000 for the 1999 model year and the rest of the world would get the S2000 the following year. It was truly a return to form sports car for the Honda Motor Company. Its 2 litre engine codenamed F20C was made from an aluminium block, 
forged aluminium pistons, dual overhead cam, and featured the thing we all know Honda for, VTEC. Instead of a belt, it had a timing chain. It had fiber reinforced metal cylinder liners and molybdenum piston skirts to reduce friction. This would mean the piston speed would be 81 feet a second. That's really quick. I know those are deep scientific words, but in layman's term, it basically means that the Honda S2000 produces 234 horsepower or 247 horsepower for the Japanese version out of a 2 litre. Why the big jump in horsepower number? Because the JDM version gets a slightly higher compression ratio. To achieve that power, you'd have to rev the S2000 up to 8300 RPM. It also redlines up to 9000 RPM. A 6-speed manual is also used to send the power to the rear wheels with the help of an LSD as standard. What does this mean for the F20C engine? It basically produced 125 horsepower per litre, which also means that it had the highest output of any mass-produced naturally aspirated engine. In 2010 though, it was beaten by the Ferrari 458. The Honda S2000 had a very successful launch because of perfect timing. They were able to capitalize on their Formula 1 experience. Also, people were really starting to see what Honda is all about. They had the Civic Type R, Integra Type R, and the NSX. All are icons today. It was all great sailing until Honda faced another challenge. You see, back then, the American consumers didn't really see the S2000 for what it truly is. Americans were all used to big powered V8 sports cars with lots of torque. The S2K was the complete opposite. It made its power by reducing friction inside the engine to allow faster engine speeds and higher red lines. Which basically meant that the S2K made all its power way at the top of the rev range. I mean, VTEC didn't kick in until 6000 RPM. You'd have to really work the transmission and rev it out to really feel its performance. Americans were not used to this idea because most American sports cars got power straight away because of low-end torque. So how did Honda tackle this issue? Well, they faced it head on. Honda wanted to change the Americans' opinions on the S2000. So to do this, they needed a bigger engine. And that's exactly what Honda did. They introduced a facelifted S2K five years into its production run, launching it in 2004. The first S2K was known as the AP1. The facelifted S2K was named the AP2. And the difference between the two? Their engines. The AP2 S2K got an updated F22C1 VTEC engine. Just like what happened to Honda S Roadsters in the 60s, the F22C1 was larger than the previous engine. It stroked at 2.2 liters. This was Honda's answer to the American market. Compared to the first high revving engine F20C, the updated F22C1 made more torque but it had a lower red line at 8200 RPM. That didn't matter though because the AP2 had just as much character as before. Honda knew how to build incredible engines. They were the producers of some of the most reliable engines the world has ever seen. That was Honda's reputation. But not just engines. Honda also knew how to make really good cars. The S2000 is one of those examples. With its long hood, clean lines and elegant design language, Everyone can pretty much agree with the fact that the S2000 is one of the most beautiful cars Honda has ever produced. And this is one of the key important ingredients to making a very successful sports car. But what's even more important to a sports car is its structure. The S2K structure is very strong because of an X-bone frame that supports the engine and transmission. All of these key ingredients, the looks, the body and the engine, attracted a whole wave of car enthusiasts. They all wanted an S2000. It became a crowd favorite. 
it was in video games and some enthusiasts got introduced to the S2K through the Fast and Furious, when Jesse got humiliated by Johnny Tran's S2000, and on Too Fast Too Furious when Suki used her famous pink S2000 on the first race. This made everyone fall in love with the S2000. The Honda S2000 was in the market from 1999 to 2009. After 10 years of production, Honda decided it was time to retire the S2K. They thought the best way to say farewell to the car was to release a few final special edition models. The most race-focused version was surprisingly made for the American market. For the first time, the US got a better version than Japan did. The model would be known as the Club Racer or CR. This was Honda's way of saying thank you to the American drivers for their enthusiasm towards the car. The CR had a track revising exhaust and suspension systems. It also featured CR specific wheels and wider tires. Honda also stripped it of any weight they could. Radio and AC were optional. They also deleted the folding roof. The folding roof was replaced with a hardtop instead. The CR also had front and rear spoilers that helped the car when cornering by providing downforce. Combining that downforce with the wider rear tire setup made the CR much lower in a straight line, but so much faster around corners. This special edition was Honda's final goodbye to the S2000. In 2009, the production of the Honda S2000 would finally end. After retiring the S2000, Honda's lineup of cars was pretty boring. Honda dealerships everywhere would be filled with CRVs, Pilots and Odysseys as more and more people wanted SUVs and minivans. Honda fans worried that Honda would no longer be fun. But today, Honda is going through the same thing they did when they introduced the S2000 back then. They're starting to bring back fun cars again. They released the modern NSX and America even got the new Civic Type R. And the Integra, I'll let you be the judge of that. Japan also got an S Roadster 2. The S660 K car, which looks so good by the way. Anyway, Honda is fun again. They just showed us that despite releasing cars for the masses, they haven't forgotten us car enthusiasts that want fun cars. They showed us that they will always remember their roots. As for a future S2000, well, only time will tell. Do you think they should bring back a modern S2000? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. If you like this video, I know you will love the documentary slash video essay I made last time on how the Toyota MR2 won the hearts of many and then died. With that being said, thanks for watching.